my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Prabhupada. Yes, Maharaj, we can start, Maharaj. Thank you, Prabhu. Om Magyana Tamarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksur Militanye Nathasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Namao Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namine Namaste Sarasati Devi Gauravani Precharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschacha Deshatarine Vanchakaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patitanam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Atvaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So welcome everyone to our ongoing study of the Srimad Bhagavatam at the level of Bhakti Vaibhav. And we're looking at the section on the Vedic cosmology. We began chapter 15 actually, which was about the descendants of Maharaj Priyavrata. And then we went on to study about Jambu Dweep, and we spent a number of classes hearing about Jambu Dweep and the different regions of Jambu Dweep. And remember, Jambu Dweep is situated in the center of Bo Mandala, and Bo Mandala is the seventh. The seventh uh, system, seventh planetary system from the top of the universe. So there's higher planets above Bhumandala, there's also lower planets. Bhumandala is central, in the center of the universe. So we heard about. Jambudweep, which is in the center of Bhumandala, and in the center of Jambudweep is Mount Meru. And Mount Meru is on the island of Ilavritavarsh. Ilavritavarsh, where Lord Shiva is the key personality and he's worshipping Lord Sankarshan. 
So we heard about the, the prayers which he offers. And then we went on to hear about the other different regions. Actually, Jambudweep is divided into nine regions. And after the, uh, the nine regions, uh, let's see, nine regions because of the nine sons of Bharat Maharaj. Now, when we read Srimad Bhagavatam, we, we get information about how Maharaj Yudhisthira and Maharaj Parikshit, they were ruling also this Bhumandala, or at least Jambudweep. Jambudweep, they were ruling. And the Pandavas also would come here. It's described when Maharaj Yudhisthira wanted to perform Rajasuya sacrifice, at that time he sent the Pandavas in different directions. So Arjuna, he came to Jambudweep and the people in Jambudweep told him that, oh, you know, why are you coming here? We're very peaceful here. We, we just enjoy here, right? Remember the description of the life in that region of Jambudweep? It was like Treta Yuga. It was all enjoyment. And they said to Arjuna, why are you coming here, disturbing us with all your weapons and things? You look like you want to fight, what, looking for battle? And Arjuna said, well, my brother's going to perform Rajasuya's sacrifice. So, if you uh, agree, you should give some gold to help us to perform the yagya. And then I won't have to fight. I won't there won't be any problem. So they have a lot of gold there and they gave Arjuna a lot of gold and he came back for the Rajasuya Yagi. He brought more than anyone. So that's how he got the name Dhananjai. He brought all, he brought all this gold, a lot of gold from Jambudweep. He brought it back for the Rajasuya Yagya. So Bharat Maharaj, he was ruling Bhumandala. Rishabh Dev, he was ruling Bhumandala. Maharaj Yudhisthira, Maharaj Pariksit, they were ruling Jambudweep. So in other yugas, in the Satya Yuga and Treta Yuga, they could they could go to these places. Even in Dwapara Yuga, Maharaj Yudhisthira, people like Arjuna and like that qualified people, they could go to Jambudweep. But in Kali Yuga, nobody's qualified. We're all unqualified. We're, we, we're stuck here in this Bharat, Bharata Kanda. Right? We explained that Bharat Vars, which is on the southern side of Jambudweep, that is divided into nine divisions, and we are on the southernmost region, along the side of the uh, saltwater ocean, and it's known as Bharat Kanda. So we're restricted. We, we, we're not eligible to go to other places. Just like, you know, going to the moon. Prabhupada said, you can't go to the moon. You got to be very, you have to have very special qualifications. So what to speak of going to the moon? We can't even go to Jambudweep. We can't go to these other different regions in Jambudweep. Although Bharat Vars is part of Jambudweep, we cannot go to the other regions of Jambudweep. Okay, so... These different... We heard about the descent of Mother Ganga also. How Mother Ganga came from the hole in the universe created by the big toe of Lord Vamana Dev. It came in to this universe and it goes first to... Where does it go first? Who remembers? When the Ganga comes in, who remembers where the Ganga goes? Maharaj. Yes, Manaji. Brahmaloka. 
yeah, Lord Brahma comes, Lord Brahma offers uh, obeisance, he offers respects to Mother Ganga. And then from Brahma Loka, where does it go? Dhruva Loka. Yes, right, to Dhruva Loka. And it spends some time there in Dhruva Loka. And then after Dhruva Loka, where does it go? The Saptarishi is right. Who else resides on Dhruva Loka beside Dhruva Maharaj? Do you know? Do you know anybody else who's living there on Dhruva Loka? Lord Vamana Dev Maharaj. Lord Vamana Dev, no. Shiro Vishnu? Yes, I think Shiro Vishnu, right. Lord Vamana Dev, he went down to Patalaloka there with Bali Maharaj. Or some, Lord Vamana Dev is, he's either there at Patalaloka with Bali Maharaj, or is it Sutapaloka? And then if he's not there, then he's in the heaven, he's in Swark. But Dhruva Loka is Shiro Vishnu, yes? the super soul in the heart of all living entities. And then after the Saptarishis, then where does it go? After... The moon. Sorry? Moon planet. The moon, right. Goes to see Chandra. Chandra. Chandra Dev. Goes to the moon planet. And then from the moon planet, then it comes on to the top of Mount Meru and divides into four. On the east side, it becomes the Sita, and on the west side, Chakshusha, on the north side, Bhadra, and on the south side, Alakananga. So the Alakananga, all these four different branches of the Ganga, they don't, they, it falls down Mount Meru, but amazingly enough, it doesn't touch Ilavritavash. Now, Mount Meru is right, it's situated there in Ilavritavarsh, but when the Ganga falls down, it doesn't fall in Ilavritavarsh, it goes to the outer regions of Jambudvi. It falls on the outer regions and from the tops of the mountains it comes down to the plain and then flows into the saltwater ocean. And from the saltwater ocean then flows down to the lower regions to liberate the sons of Maharaj Saga. So we heard about the descent of Mother Ganga, how she comes. By hearing about the descent of Mother Ganga, we are able to get more idea about the cosmology of the universe. All right, so we heard about the descent of Mother Ganga and we heard about the different regions in Jambadweep and how the different people offered prayers. All right? And then we heard about all the glories of Bharat Varsa and how the demigods in Swark, they're all hoping that they see next time when they take their birth in Bharat Varsa, they're not going to spend their time to do piety, but they want to do devotional service. Because by doing devotional service, they can be sure to get the ultimate goal of life. They said just to come up and down, to go up to the heavenly planets and come back down, come up and down, just this enjoyment, flickering enjoyment, right? Chapala Sukha, flickering enjoyment. Some enjoyment in the heavenly planets for, for 10,000 years or so, and then they come back. And then they have to do more piety, and then they go up again, and enjoy, and then come back, like this, up and down. So the demigods say, we don't want to waste that opportunity of taking birth in Bharat Varsha, we want to use it to go back to Godhead. And we also heard how they view the worship of demigods. Now we're going to go on today to chapter 20. And we're going to hear how different regions of Bomandala they worship different demigods. 
maybe you remember previously um, in uh, in the in the previous chapter chapter 19 we heard about the demigods the worship of the demigods how uh, let me show you uh, yeah it was in text number 26 chapter 19 text 26 there talks about demigod worship and how people in Bharat Varsa they are fond to worship demigods. Now is that acceptable for devotees? Devotees we can also worship demigods, right? Who worship demigods? What are some examples of devotees who worship demigods? Ramakrishna Prabhu you can tell us. Those who worship demigods, is that what you question, Maharaj? Yeah, demigods. I want to know what, which devotees worship demigods. Okay. Those devotees who are less intelligent, as told by Bhagavad Gita also by Krishna, and those who are, uh, uh, who desire for quick material success, and who do not have adequate uh, faith in Krishna's uh, dealings, these are the people who is, are referred here as Hrita, Apa Hrita Gyana. Is that always the case? Mostly, mostly that's the case. Can you give some examples, exceptions, some very good devotees, pure devotees who also worship demigods? <clears throat> well, I'm not able to quickly recall it, someone like that. <clears throat> All right, we'll, we'll open it up. Someone else? Yes, Mataji. Maharaj Prithu. Maharaj, I would recollect Maharaj Bharata. He yeah. actually worshipped all the different demigods, considering them to be the limbs of the Supreme Lord. That's the that's Lord. the example I was looking for. Yes, Bharat Maharaj, right? You can explain more. He he worshipped. How did he worship? He considered that each and every demigod to be different limbs of the Lord and thereby worshipping them was uh, with the intention of sac satisfying the Supreme Lord as the demigods as uh, his uh, as the part and parcel and the servants of the Supreme Lord. Mm -hmm. He was not aspiring for a separate kind of a benefit from them but he was aspiring for the all inclusions of uh, his worship. Can you give some examples of which which parts of the body do some demigods represent? Can you think of some example? Like, like the mouth represents the fire. The mouth represents the fire, the sacrificial the, fire. The eyes, the eyes represent the uh, the sun is represented as the eyes. Yes, the sun is the eyes. Yeah. And. and uh, also, it is referred like uh, Mitra and Varuna are also represented in uh, <clears throat> in the evacuation or the uh, genitals part of it, like that. Okay. Yeah. I, Indra, Indra is like the arm of the Lord. Of, yes, Indra is the arms. Indra is like the arm. The upper planets are like the upper part of the body, the, the head part of the body. And then the low, hellish plant, lower regions are like the feet of the Lord. So, yes, as, as the, the Satyaloka or the Brahma is represented with the forehead and so on. Yes. Of course, the gopis, they also worship Kadyayani. They, they worship Kadyayani to get Krishna as a husband. That was a very special case. But Bharat Maharaj is the proper example that he worshipped the demigods and well he didn't actually worship the demigods but when they did the yagyas when they were and because he was a ruler he was a king so he was required to attend many different ritualistic ceremonies and they would offer many different oblations to different demigods but he would always see 
or the offerings and the oblations that they're offering to the demigods as parts of the body of the Supreme Lord. He saw everything in relation to Vasudev, Lord Krishna. And so the, that was uh, his perfection, his devotion, his pure devotion. So here in this next chapter we're going to hear about how the, the demigods are also worshipped. Uh, in the previous chapter, Prabhupada spoke, as you mentioned, about Sakama devotees. Sakama devotees, people like, who, who was the Sakama Bhakta? Paramananda? Sakama Bhakta? Who worshipped the Lord with material desires? Dhruva Maharaj? Yes, right. Dhruva Maharaj, yes. Anybody else? You can think of another one who was also having material desires, distress? Gajendra. Right, yes, Gajendra. So their worship was not pure, you know, it was Sakama Bhakta, but they became pure. They became pure. So that's the arrangement of the Lord, that He can change the Sakama devotee into the Akama devotee. From a devotee with material desires, they become a devotee with no material desires. The, the Krishna arranges to give them shelter at his lotus feet. So worshipping demigods is a, it's not against the principles of devotional service if we have the proper understanding, but it's not Prabhupada explains, he said, uh, Krishna doesn't say that we should worship him indirectly. Krish, rather, Krishna says we should worship him directly. Manmana bhava madbhakto, right? Krishna said, Krishna never, he never speaks about worshipping him indirectly. Prabhupada gives the example, he said, just like if somebody gives you a massage, so they massage your legs, but the, you benefit the whole person benefits, or, so, or somebody uh, may may uh, they may give some nice treatment for your hand, uh, some little exercise for your hand to loosen the muscles, or maybe your shoulders get stiff or something. So they're giving service to one part of the body. But the person benefits, we benefit from that. So in the same way, when the devotee, when someone offers something to the Lord, if they offer it to one part of the Lord, the Lord also benefits. So the Lord also accepts that offering, he's, he's pleased. But direct worship is always recommended, rather than just worshipping some part of the Lord. All right, so we're going to go on and to hear about the other regions of Bhumandala because we spent a lot of time looking at Jambudweep. Now we're going to look at the region. Jambudweep is in the center of Bhumandala. We're going to look at the, the, the rest of Bhumandala. And we're told how there are different islands around Bhumandala. And we're given this information, we're given uh, details that it's all, they're all around the center. Jambu Dweep's in the center and then they're like discs which come one after the other. And between each region of land, tract of land, there's an ocean of different liquids. So we're going to hear about these things. We have we have, first of all, we have, well, we have the, the island of uh, Plaster, uh, Plaster Dweep, right? The island of Plaksha Dweep, and then Samal, Samali Dweep, and then Kusha Dweep, and then Krocha Dweep, 
and then Saka Dweep, and then finally Pushkara Dweep. So one, two, three, four, five islands. One, two, three, four, five, six islands, right? Because Jambudweep was the seventh one, and we're not, we're finished with Jambudweep. We're going to look at these six islands tonight, along with what's outside the islands, after the islands, and we get more information of what goes on there. So I thought we could divide it up among you and give each group an island to take and you can tell us what's going on in these different islands. All right? How many people do we have in the class? Uh, Maharaj, we have uh, uh, 16 Maharaj. 16? Okay. so. We have how many islands? One, two, three, four, five, six. Six islands. Six into eighteen. So three people. Three people. So, okay, Maharaj. I'll put it in the main group. So group one will do, first of all, the Plaksha Dweep. And group two, Samala Dweep. Group three, Kusha Dweep, Group 4, Krocha Dweep, Group 5, Shaka Dweep, and Group 6, Pushkara Dweep. Okay, much. We just want to know what's, what's happening there, what's surrounding, what kind of ocean is on either side, and who lives there, and tell us about the place and, and who, the, who they're worshipping and how they're worshipping. That's an important part, actually. Right? Okay. How much time do we have, Maharaj? Well, ten minutes should be enough. Okay, Maharaj. There's a very short description. The prayers are very short here. Okay? Okay, I'll, I'll create the... Now. Okay, thank you.
Jai Govinda Prabhu, I think we could close the rooms now. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Since it's been over now. Our first group is supposed to talk about the Prakshadripa. Uh, Prakshadripa is uh, the double size in the size of uh, Jambu Dripa. And uh, the Prakshadripa is governed by Itma Drija, son of Kittu. Uh, uh, one of the son of Priyavrata. And because of the one tree which is called as Plaksha tree, the silent got the name of Plaksha Deepa. And the, this tree is very huge and roots are with fire with seven flames. And here this is surrounded by sugarcane juice um, ocean. And it's 200,000 yojanas, double of Jambu Deepa. And the inhabitants live for 1,000 years and they worship the Supreme Person of God. So they lived for 1,000 years. How long did the people on Jambadweep live for? Do you remember on the Bomaswarga region? How long were they living there? The residents in Bomaswarg, the eight regions on Jambadweep, there's Bharatvars. Huh? 10, 000, 10, 000. 10, 000. 10 000 years. Yeah, that's right. 10,000 years, right. But here, on this Plakshadweep, they're living for 1,000 years. But still, very similar. They're like demigods. And they and it said also about the, the pregnancy of the women is also like demigods. So how is it? What is the specific nature of their pregnancy? How do they give birth? They give birth the very last one year before they actually give up their bodies. And so it's only at that year they have a pregnant. Right. And, and the child takes, they give birth immediately, they can give birth immediately. Just like when Kunti got her benediction to call the demigods, when she gave birth, you know, she didn't have to undergo pregnancy for nine months. She immediately delivered the child. So it's like that the, the de with the demigods. They have a very different kind of existence compared to our own. So you, you mentioned that, that on one side, what, what is between Jamba Dweep and Plaksha Dweep? There's an ocean of what? Salt water. Salt water. And on the other side of Plakshadweep? Sugar cane. Sugar cane. Sugar cane juice. Okay. So, uh, and they're worshipping the sun god. Yes, ma'am. Can you tell us something about the sun god? Yes. Do you know the prayer in the Brahma Samhita about the sun god? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yes, go ahead, say it. Yes, 
Yes, right. He's mounting the wheel of time. So he controls time, right? Yes, ma'am. And the sun is compared to which part of the body of the Lord? Eyes, eyes. The eye of the Lord, right. We are all dependent on the sun. Without the sun, we cannot see anything. So we're very much dependent on the sun. What, 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 why else do we depend on the sun, apart from seeing? Why else? Energy, did, Maharaj. Huh? Energy, energy, Maharaj. Energy? Yeah. What? Energy. Solar, solar energy? Yeah. How do we, what do you mean? Use that energy for what? To perform the activities. Just without the sun god's appearance, we cannot be active. Mm, I don't know if that's, you know, sometimes, you know, it's so hot here, sometimes I feel, I wish it wasn't so hot, I could have more energy. The, 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 the heat makes us all so tired. Yeah. <laughs> it, 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 it takes away our energy, the heat. But, it, but the source of the life also, Mother. The source of life, right, yes. Source of life. For what? The sun is the source of life for? You're not farming people, eh? You don't do agricultural work. The, you need the sun to grow for vegetables. Yes. Huh? But the plants, plants life also. With yeah, the plants, life. right. Plants, Rain life. Hmm? Rainfall also. Of course, we need the rain also, yes, but the sun is also important. You know, how could they do the harvest? How could they harvest the rice and the wheat if there was no sun? So it provides heat and light also to see everything. Because they used to tell the Maharaj, photosynthesis, we need sunlight. Yes, we need sunlight. And also, what about the sun, uh, the sun god? How did Krishna use the sun god? No, no. Krishna. Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Uh, he passed the Vedic knowledge to the sun god. Yes. You know the verse, Bhagavad Gita? Yes. Yeah. Imam Vivasvate Yogam, Sautavanaham Akhyavim, Vivasman Manave Praha, Manurikshwakave Vrithi. Yes. Translation? I imparted this imperishable scientific knowledge to the sun god Vivasman. Vivasman imparted to his son. Uh, Manu, Manu imparted his knowledge to his son, Ikshwaku. Okay, very good. Yes, right. So Krishna, the sun god, gives, Lord Krishna gives the sun god the very, the knowledge. He speaks the Bhagavad Gita and this, it's like a, a line of the cyclic succession, right? But that line was broken. In course of time, the knowledge was lost and Lord Krishna had to come again and re-establish. And we also, we also see the connect with the Kshatriyas. There's the, dy the dynasty of the Kshatriyas comes from the sun god, right? Who was born in the dy dynasty coming from the sun god? Yes. Lord Ramachandra appears in the line coming from the sun god. Very good. Okay. So, what about the prayer offered? How did they pray to the sun god?
Did you get a chance to look at the prayer? Yes. Number five. Yes, text number five, right. Yeah. Let us take shelter of the Sangha, who is the reflection of God Vishnu. Okay. The whole expanding Supreme Personality Godhead, the oldest of all persons. The oldest of all persons, yeah. <laughs> you will see later on in the chapter, it describes that one of the names of the Lord is Mritabha that he brought life into a dead planet. It's only with the, when, the, when the sun comes into this planet, then life begins. Without the sun, there was no light. So the light, the sun is very important in the universe. Okay. Uh, Anything else we can think about the Sun God? The Prabhupada writes in the purport, uh, although the worship of the Sun God, I'm sharing the screen, I think. You can see it? It's my screen. You can see the screen, yeah? So this is the purport of text number five here. Although the worship of the Sun God is recommended in this mantra, he is worshipped not as the Supreme Personality of Godhead, but as his powerful representative. Right? So, a distinction. He's, we have to worship, we can worship the Sun God, but worship him in the proper way. And what is the result of people worshipping the Sun God? Where are they going to go? Are they going to go back to Godhead? Yes, right. Who is worshipping the Sun God, he will go to the Sun Planet. Yes, right. They'll go to the sun planet, right. From Prabhupada's purport, people who are almost blind because of lusty desires are recommended to worship the demigods to have their material desires fulfilled. But actually, those desires are not fulfilled by the material demigods. Whatever the demigods do is done with the sanction of Lord Vishnu. People who are too lusty worship various demigods instead of worshipping Lord Vishnu, the super soul of all living entities. But ultimately it is Lord Vishnu they worship because he is the super soul of all demigods. So the demigods also have Lord Vishnu in their heart as a super soul. All right. And then text 6 describes more about the qualities of the residents of Plakshadvi. Longevity, sensory prowess, physical and mental strength, intelligence and bravery, all manifested equally in the inhabitants. Okay, then let's hear from the next group. They're going to tell us about the next island. Next island is Yes. Hare Krishna. Next island is Salmili The master of Salmini Deep is Yajya Bahu, who is the son of Maharaj Priyavata. And he divided this island into seven parts and gave to his seven sons for ruling. And uh, there are, in this island, there are seven mountains and seven rivers. And in these habitants, uh, praying the sun, sun god, uh, moon god, moon god. And they are strictly following the birth.
Yes. Uh, March, continuing from there, there is also a mention that the Shalma tree of there is a Shalmali tree from which the island took its name. Uh, this tree specifically is uh, 100 yojanas broad, or which is 800 miles, or 1,100 yojanas tall, which is 8,800 miles. And this tree is the residence of Garuda, who offers uh, Lord Vishnu a lot of Vedic prayers. And then we see that um, the son of Maharaj Priyavata, who is Yaknabahu, uh, he is the master of uh, Shalma, this Shalmali Dweepa. He divided the land into seven tracks, which Ongo and Prabhu mentioned. And I think the last part, uh, Nand Kishore Prabhu. Yeah, Hare Krishna. Please accept my humble obeisances, Guru Maharaj. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Uh, in the last, it's mentioned that uh, what prayers are being offered to the moon god and uh, it's said that the inhabitants of Shalmala Dweep are praying that they mention that the moon god has divided time, uh, a full month into two fortnights. One is called Shukla and other is Krishna and this he does in order to distribute food grains to the Pitas and the demigods. Uh, thus they refer to him as the moon who is dividing time and he is the king of all residents of the universe and they pray to him that may he remain their king and guide and in that way they offer their obeisances unto the moon god. Hmm. Thank you. Can you tell us something about the moon? How is it? Is it? Are there some references about the moon in Bhagavad Gita? Yes, Guru Maharaj. In the 15th chapter, verse 13, it said, uh, Gam avishya cha bhutani dharayami ahamojasa pushnami cha shadi sarvaha soma bhutho rasatmaka. Uh, where, where the Lord says that He is entering into every planet and it's because of His energy that the planets stay in the orbit and the Lord becomes the moon and therefore supplies the juice of life to all the vegetables. Okay. The juice of life to all the vegetables. Without the moon, the vegetables will have no taste. Actually, you find it like that nowadays because in, I know in, in China, they grow the vegetables under, a, they grow them in a plastic tent. They have these huge plastic tents and they, they grow them in there because it, you know, then they, they don't get all the, uh, the snow <laughs> or the ice and you know they have these special tents for growing things but because the tents don't get the rays of light the same so the vegetables don't have taste the conditions are so artificial this is Kali Yuga the vegetables and the, 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 the food which we grow the quality is much deteriorated from how it used to be. So the moon, uh, the moon also we have, a, the, we have the dynasty of the Kshatriya kings coming from the moon, right? Who appeared in the line from the moon? Krishna. Yes, right. Lord Krishna appeared in the moon, right? It is said that Lord Krishna appeared on the eighth day of the moon, but the moon was so joyful that the Lord was appearing in his line that the moon was full on that particular occasion. Anything else about the moon? Also, there is uh, in Bhagavad Gita, there is one more reference in 10th chapter, Nakshatrana Maham Sheshi. Yes. Can you give me the English translation? Of the, of the stars, I am the moon. Okay. Of the, of, of the stars or uh, of the nakshatras, I am the moon. Yeah, of the nakshatras, I am the moon. Thank you. Yeah, Krishna's vibhutis. So, people worship the moon god, some people worship the sun god. 
I remember in Bombay, in Mumbai, there's those Parsi people, right? The Parsi people, who do they worship? They worship Fire God, Maharaj. The Fire God, okay. So we're going to hear about the Fire God now. That's the next one, I think. Kroshadweep. All right, who's going to speak on Kroshadweep? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Maharaj, the Kushadipa, the slokas are from 13, it explains about the Kushadipa from 13 to 17, Maharaj. Okay. So, Kushadipa, it is surrounded by an ocean of liquid tea and it is as broad as the island itself. And the dimensions of the Kushadipa is uh, 800,000 uh, 800, yojanas. It is equal to uh, 64 lakhs miles wide. So, on, so on, the, on one side there's ghee, what's on the other side? A liquor. Yes, the outside of the ocean of the liquor is the this Kusha Dipamana. It's the liquor, ocean of liquor. Oh, Kusha Dweep is surrounded by an ocean of Kushadweep surrounded by an ocean of ghee. So Maladweep so, so was surrounded by liquor. So liquor is on the inside of the Kushadweep and on the outside of the Kushadweep is the ghee. Ghee. Right. Okay. And uh, in the Kushadweep, uh, there are the clumps of uh, Kusha grass. So, uh, uh, <laughs> And this uh, Kusha grass uh, was uh, created by the demigods, by the will of the Supreme Lord. And uh, it appears like a second form of the fire, which is, it be, which is very mild and with the pleasing uh, flames. And mm. it illuminates in all directions. Mm. <laughs> yes, and Prabhupada's purpur, he has an interesting purpur. He talks about his own conviction. Can you tell us what, is, what does Prabhupada say about it? Um, uh, yeah, here it talks about the flames on the moon, however, unlike those on the sun, must be mild and pleasing. This is our conviction. So, uh, the modern theory that the, uh, that the moon uh, is full of dust is not accepted in the verses of Srimad Bhagavatam. So, and the modern theory talks about the moon is full of dust, so which is you know as told by the, the scientists and uh, uh, the astronauts, you know, who, 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 who tells that they have uh, seen the they landed in the moon and then explains. So this is not not, not at all accepted in this uh, in the verse of Srimad Bhagavatam. Mm -hmm. And also in this uh, purpose, the Prabhupada explains uh, uh, you know uh, about the Shila Vishwanatha Chakrabarti Thakura saying that. Uh, uh, the kusha grass illuminates in all directions, but its flames are very mild and pleasing. So this gives some idea of the flames existing on the moon also. Mm -hmm. Okay. And who are they worshipping here? Okay, and how do they worship? Well, they are following the Kovarna system. Huh? They are worshipping the Supreme Personality in the form of fire. Yeah. Uh, usually. Maharaj in uh, uh, Sloka number 16, uh, it uh, explains about uh, um, how they perform the ritualistic uh, ceremonies. So they do the uh, ritualistic ceremonies according to the orders of the Vedic scriptures. Uh, and thus they worship the Lord 
in this aspect as the demigod of fire. Yes, the demigod of fire. In the Vayu Purana, there's a, a statement that the, the earth planet, you know, the earth planet, it, there's a lot of water on the earth planet, but actually the, the, the basis of the earth planet is earth. It's a con concentrated earth. And on the the moon, the sun planet, it's constant. The the concentration is on more on fire. But on the moon planet, the they said the moon planet is concentrated water. That's the the, the difference between these different places. So the, well, not just here, in, uh, the, we're talking here about uh, Bomandala, but uh, in the universal system, the moon planet is made up of concentrated water, and the earth is earth itself. And the sun, of course, there, there, has, there are people there on the sun planet. People are, you know, some, of course, here on this planet, people are, they think, how is it possible any life could be there? But there, life is everywhere. Living entities are everywhere. Just on, the, the, the point is that on the sun planet, the composition of the bodies will be different. The composition of the bodies of the living entities on the sun planet will be predominantly fire. To live on that, in that fiery atmosphere, they have to have a fiery body. And similarly, on other planets, the life will be there, but in different compositions, not like our own earth, earthly bodies. And as you go to the higher planets, like in Swarga and up Brahmaloka and so on, everything becomes more and more subtle. And there's no gross body. This, this is difficult for people to understand how, you know, we, all, we tend to be very limited in how we understand life. We think of life only as we know it as we can see with our eyes. And when we hear about beings having celestial bodies, they think, oh, it's just some story, just some fairy tale, it's not really true, and no facts. But the Vedas, and here in Srimad Bhagavatam, it's very clearly indicated how these different demigods can come. Now, the de when they sometimes they will come and be visible, but often they will come, they will not be visible. They're not obliged. If they want to show themselves to someone, they can, but they're not obliged. Their forms are like that. Their forms are uh, subtle. So, can it be perceived? Just like the mind cannot be seen. But we have a mind, an intelligence, we have these things, but we can't see it. So the demigods, they have also subtle forms, which we're not able to see so clearly. So on the different planets, different living entities will have these different bodies. So Mantra 17 describes how they worship the fire god. O fire god, you are a part of the supreme personality of Godhead, Hari, and you carry to him all the offerings of sacrifice. Therefore, we request you to offer to the supreme personality of Godhead the yagnic ingredients we are offering, the demigods. For the Lord is the real enjoyer. So the, 
the devotees in Kushadweep are asking the fire god to carry their offering and give it to the Lord. Just like we know when we do the yagya, when you do the fire sacrifice, then that fire is like the tongue of the Lord. And we offer the grains and the ghee in, onto the tongue of the Lord in the form of the fire. And Prabhupada gives a nice example about the tax collector is taking money from all the citizens, but then he gives it to the government office, to the treasury. It's not for him. He's only collecting on behalf of the, the government. So the same way the demigods, they accept the offerings, it's not for them, but it's for offering to the Supreme Lord. Just to read from Prabhupada's purport here, the text 17, Similarly, all the demigods, as faithful servants of the Supreme Lord, hand over to the Supreme Lord whatever is offered to them in sacrificial performances. There is no fault in worshipping the demigods with this understanding, but to think that the demigods are independent of the Supreme Personality of Godhead and equal to Him is called Rita Jnana, a loss of intelligence. Right? So one who thinks that the demigods themselves are the actual benefactors is mistaken. All right, so fire, the sun, and the moon, very basic, very important ingredients in everything. We need the sun for the heat and light. Fire is very important. In Bhagavad Gita, Krishna speaks about the fire of digestion. That we need to have that fire in the body, in the belly, to digest food. If we have no digestion, then we cannot, no, we have no appetite, we don't want to eat. That's a, a serious problem. So that fire there in the belly and the fire which is used for to create energy, generally we, we use fire to generate electricity, which is used to provide so much power everywhere. Fire for cooking, baking, fire for heating, molding things. So fire is a very important element in the universe. And the fire god, very important personality. So he's being worshipped here. So we heard the moon god, is, the sun god is worshipped, the moon god is worshipped, and the fire god is worshipped. Okay, we'll go ahead, the next group, we're going to hear about Krochadweep. Hare Krishna Maharaj, I have no obeisances to you. The fourth island is Krochadweepa. The inner circle is surrounded by ocean of clarified butter and the outer circle it is surrounded by ocean of milk. And... Uh, this is actually having the width of twice of the width of the previous inner circle of uh, clarified butter, like 128 lakhs miles. And um, the worshipable deity is Varuna. They are worshipping the Lord in the form of water, the energy of the Lord. And in the Krenchad Weep, there is a great mountain known as Krencha. So the name actually came after that mountain. The Weep becomes Krenchad Weepa. And the vegetables are all actually living on the slopes of Mount Krencha were attacked and devastated by Kartikeya. But because of the energy of milk, they actually, it is, the whole vegetation is protected by Varuna Deva. The ruler of the island is one of the son of Maharaj Priyabrata. His name was Krita Prishta and he was very learned scholar. He divided the whole island into seven uh, land, seven land, and each land has one mountain and one river. 
he has divided the seven land into his seven sons and the names are given his seven sons names are given and and island uh, sorry the mountain names are mentioned in text 21 ama madhurga megaprastha sudama brajishta lokitarna and vanapasti and uh, similarly seven rivers are also mentioned and the inhabitants of the krenchadiba is divided into four castes purushas rishabas dravinas and devakas they actually uh, sanctified they purified themselves by these uh, rivers the seven rivers and they worship varuna they actually consider the water as the energy of the lord they indirectly worship the supreme personality of godhead and uh, they are worshiping that in the 23rd verse the offering prayers like this o water of the rivers you have obtained energy from the supreme personality of godhead therefore you purify the three planetary systems known as bhuloka bhuvarloka and svargaloka by your constitutional nature you take away sins and that is why we are touching you kindly continue to purify us so they are worshiping the lord in the form of water mm. can you tell us something about varuna dev you know any of the past times of varuna dev uh govardhana leela that is indra or indra varuna dev uh thank you sir lord ramachandra was thank you varuna i'm sorry what Lord Ramachandra was angry at the Lord Varuna. Yes, can you tell us why? Uh, because uh, he wanted to create that bridge, uh, so uh, he was uh, calling Varuna, and he was not appearing. Mm-hmm. And then uh, he decided to uh, Lord Ramachandra was angry, and he wanted to punish. At that time, Varuna appeared, and then he uh, like uh, divided the ocean into two halves, and then. Lord Rama was able to clean the bridge. Hare Krishna, Raj. Yes. Srimad Bhagavatam, Nanda Maharaj is arrested by Varuna, sir. Yes, yes. right. Yes. That time, well, actually, Varuna didn't want to have darshan of the Lord. So, mm-hmm. in that way, Krishna and Balram, they went and released the father from the bonds of Varuna. Why did Nanda Maharaj get arrested? He, he has taken the bath uh, which we are not supposed to take at that time little few minutes before the uh, bathing tank he took bath on ekadashi day yes at the end of the ekadashi right yeah yeah and he got arrested by a foolish a foolish servant of varuna actually nanda maharaj didn't do anything wrong but the, the servant of varuna was foolish and then what happened when lord krishna came there Varunadeva um, asked for the forgiveness, and he prayed the Lord. So he 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 could have the darshan of the Lord. Yes, Nanda Ma- Nanda Maharaj was surprised to see how much respect Varuna had for Lord Krishna. When Lord Krishna came there, Varunadeva was worshiping Krishna. So Nanda Maharaj was surprised because Nanda Maharaj was thinking Krishna is my son. So he, so he was surprised. After that, he he re- recollected what Dargamani taught. If, uh, he was discussing with his friends about the Dargamani's words after this incident also. I'm sorry, I'm I'm not I can't understand what you're saying. No, he he was discussing with his friends that the Dargamani uh, already he predicted that he is a not normal child. Yeah, that he would that he would cross over all. difficulties they would get rid of be able to overcome all difficulties by the grace of lord krishna right okay very good thank you very much also even bali maharaj also was bound by the ropes of varuna oh yes very nice yes bali maharaj was bound up by the ropes of varuna <laughs> hmm. all right very nice examples hari krishna maharaj yes 
even in uh, Varaha Leela also, Varuna Deva will uh, uh, inspire, uh, uh, enthuse Hiranyaksha to fight with, uh, I am not a suitable person. Oh, fight. yes. I am old. Um, <laughs> Person is, uh, supreme person, yes. Uh, yes. I think uh, Sindhi people have the custom to worship Varuna. They call it Juli Lao, right? They call him, they know, uh, there's a name Juli Lao. They have a deity, Juli Lao. And yes, Maharaj. Juli Lao. That, that's Varuna? Yes, Maharaj. Yes. Yeah, I know that in. Uh, the Hindu temple in Hong Kong, they have a, a Juli Lao deity there. It's very popular for the Sindhi people. So here you, the residents of Kroncha Dweep are offering their prayers to Lord Varuna. And they're asking Lord Varuna that purify us through your energy, the water of the rivers. So taking bath in the rivers is so nice, right? When you bathe in the river, you go to Ganga or somewhere like that, where, where there's a nice flowing river and you can take bath, especially when it's very hot and humid, you can go and bathe in the river. It's so purifying. So the, the residents of Kroncha Dweep, they're saying, Please kindly con continue to purify us hmm? by your, you take away sins. That is why we are, just by touching, just by touching these rivers, takes away sins and purifies us. But, of course, bathing in the holy rivers will purify after a long time. But, how can we get purified quickly? Chanting Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Right. And by the association of nice association devotee. of devotees. Yes, right. By the grace of the Vaishnava, Vaishnava Thakur, we will purify very quickly. So the energy, energies in the river, energy in the sun and the moon, it's all this energy is coming from the Lord. In Prabhupada's purport there, text number 23, the energy of the Lord acts throughout the creation. Just as heat and light, the energies of the sun act within the universe and make everything work. The specific rivers mentioned in the Shastras are also energies of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And people who regularly bathe in them are purified. It can actually be seen that many people are cured of a disease simply by bathing in the Ganga. Similarly, the inhabitants of Kroncha Dweep purify themselves by bathing in the rivers there. Very nice. All right, next group, Shaka Dweep. Hare Krishna Maharaj, Nanda Pranam. Hare Krishna. Uh, sh yes, Maharaj. Shaka Dweep uh, is, uh, is, is around 32,000 yojanas in width, and an inner circle is uh, surrounded by ocean of milk, and the outer circle is by ocean of churned yogurt. And there is a big shaka tree, which is very fragrant, and which uh, its uh, fragrance is uh, covers the entire island. And the master of the island is the son of uh, Priyavarta, known as Mehatipi. And he has divided the island into seven sections to his seven sons, which is named after his sons, Proj Projava, Manajava, Pavanama, Durma. Dura, Duranika and Cheta, Cheta Raha, Bahu Rupa and Vishwarada. And he is, after, after dividing it, he has retired himself and he has gone into meditation. Uh, his mind fixed in the lotus feet of Supreme Personality Godhead. All right. Who do they, who do they worship there? 
Maharaj, Shobha Mataji will continue now. Hare Krishna Maharaj, Dandra Pranam. Uh, they worship uh, Supreme Lord in the form of Vayu actually. And uh, here it is saying that in the land there are seven boundary mountains and seven rivers. And the mountains are Isana, Purisranga, Belapadra, Satakesra, Sasrasrota, Devapala, and Mahanasa. Then the seven rivers are Anakha, Ayurda, Upeas Prishti, Aparajita, Panchavadi, Sasrasruti, and Nijatrati. And then the inhabitants of this island are divided into four castes. The name of the castes are Ritabrata, Satyabrata, Dhanabrata, and Anubrata. And it is exactly resembled Brahmana, Kshatriya, Vaisya, and Sudra, the four orders of the society. And they practice pranayama and mystic yoga. And in trance, they worship the Supreme Lord in the form of Vayu. And they, uh, the supra, uh, they are uh, praying, O oh, Supreme Person, situated as the super soul within the body, you direct the various actions of different ayers, such as prana, and thus you maintain all living entities. O oh Lord, may you protect us from all dangers. And Srila Prabhupada, um, in his purport, he says that, through the mystic yoga practice called pranayama, the yogi controls the airs within the body to maintain the body in a healthy condition. And in this way, yogi comes to the point of trance and tries to see the super soul within the core of the heart. Pranayama is the means to attain samadhi, trance, in order to fully absorb oneself in seeing the Supreme Lord as Antaryami, the super soul within the core of heart. Hare Krishna. So, do you do pranayama? Yeah, Yama Niyama and that Ashtanga Yoga. Are you doing Pranayam? I'm sorry, Maharaj, I'm not doing it. So you know any people who do this Pranayam? Yes, but here a lot of people are doing yoga and uh, that is actually uh, Pranayama that I don't know whether they are doing this Pranayama or not. Generally, the Ashtanga yogis who do the pranayam, yeah. right, is what but Prabhupada calls the pranayam the nose pressing yoga. <laughs> the nose pressing yoga. You press press with the left nostril and then breathe in in the right nostril and then breathe out in the left nostril and breathe in, you know, like that. And you press, press the one side of the nose, then the other side of the nose. So as Prabhupada says, certainly mentioned here is this is to keep the body in a healthy condition. And we need to have a healthy body for the service of Lord Krishna. So it's certainly very important. But the, the real purpose of the healthy condition is that we can fix the mind on the super soul within the core of the heart. And come to the stage, pranayama is a means to come to samadhi, right? Pranayama, and then pra, prajahara, dharana, dhyana, samadhi. And so pranayama is the fourth stage and samadhi is the eighth stage. So it's all different levels of concentration, meditation. And pranayama is a preliminary means to that. Certainly, by pranayama, people can prolong their life. And Prabhupada spoke about that. He said, like at Kumbha Mela, he said, when Kumbha Mela takes place, there will be people who come there. He said, some of them are coming from caves in the Himalayas, and they may be hundreds of years old, but they just look like ordinary people. You can't tell. He said they can do pranayama, they are doing pranayama and they control their breath and they have the breath under so much control that they, are, they can prolong their life to hundreds of years. But of course, what is the good of that? It's, what is the good of a long life? Like a tree, <laughs> just to have a long life. Trees also live a long time, but what's the good? that consciousness. Lord Chaitanya was in this world only 48 years and Shankaracharya spent only 32 years, but they made great contributions. 
So Prabhupada said, better one moment of full consciousness than a lifetime like a tree. Anyway, pranayama is the, the system which is described here, how they're uh, worshipping the, the Lord in the form of Vayu. Do we know anything about Vayu, Lord Vayu? Anybody know any, any information about Lord Vayu? Can think of anything? Hare Krishna Maharaj in Bhagavad Gita it is saying that Vayu carries fragrance, uh, like that uh, uh, living entity also carries different conceptions of uh, body. That also is, uh, it is, uh, that is Sariram Yadavap Nodi Yatshap Yudkramati Sriha Grihi Toitani Samyadi Vayu Gantani Vasyat. I thought it said like the air carries the aroma. Uh, air carries the aroma, yeah. Uh, so Vayu, generally we think of Vayu as the wind god, right? Yes. So, who was the son of Vayu? Hare Krishna Maharaj. One is uh, uh, Bhima and one is uh, Hanuman. Hanuman. Yeah. Hanuman. Hanuman, right. And Bhima, yeah. Bhima also. Yeah. And they had a pastime together, right? When Bhima went up the Himalayas, Han there was an old monkey laying on the path. Right, he wouldn't move. He said, you move me. And then Bhim tried to move, he couldn't move him. And then he understood, oh, you must be my brother. So they were brothers. So Hanuman gave a benediction to Bhima. Where did Hanuman reside? On the flag of Maharaj. On whose flag? The flag of chariot of Arjuna. Right, on the flag. Yeah, Kapitwaja, right, on the flag of Arjuna. And he said, whenever you need me, you yell and I, I will come. Or just the, the yell of Hanuman would be there to support. Who else is connected to Vayu? Maharaj, uh, Madhvacharya is also an incarnation right. of Right, that's right, yes. Madhvacharya, yes. And what did Madhvacharya do? Actually, what, it's a pastime. He went to the Himalayas, right? And he was up at Badarik Ashram. And in Badarik Ashram, there was a de there's a deity of Vyasadeva. So he was reading his commentary on the Bhagavad Gita to the deity of Vyasadeva. And then a voice spoke to him. A voice spoke to him, said, come outside, I want to speak to you in private. So Madhvacharya went outside and he was carried by the wind god, he was carried to the upper region of Badarik Ashram. There's the earthly Badarik Ashram and there's the higher Badarik Ashram. So Madhvacharya was taken up there because he's the son of Vayu, so Vayu could transport him up to the higher region and there he directly met Srila Vyasadeva, not just the deity. But Srila Vyasadeva was there in the higher Badarik Ashram. And so Madhvacharya read his commentary on the Bhagavad Gita to Vyasadeva. And Vyasadeva said, yes, very nice, very good. You preach this, you go everywhere and preach this knowledge everywhere. So this is some pastimes of Vayu. Okay. So we'll go ahead. We still have uh, what the next island is Pushta Pushta Dweep. Pushkara Dweep. Yes, Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, next to <clears throat> Shaka Dweep, it is uh, Pushkara Dweep, which is surrounded by uh, the outer uh, circle is surrounded by ocean of yogurt. And uh, next, uh, you have this, uh, we have this Pushkara Dweep. Again, it is surrounded by a portion of uh, sweet water, that is tasteful water. Uh, it, uh, and the, the dimensions, it is uh, 6,400,000 yodhanas and it is uh, twice as the ocean of yogurt. That is the size of uh, this, uh, uh, this, this, uh, this 
Vipa Maharaj. And uh, in this Vipa, there is a gold, uh, there is a lotus flower with 100,000 pure gold, golden petals, which are as effulgent as flame of fire. And uh, this lotus flower is considered to be the sitting place of Brahma. And yes. in the middle of this uh, island, uh, there is a gr great mountain named as Manasotara, which formed the boundary between the uh, inner side and the outer side of the island. And its breadth and height of 10,000 yojanas. On that mountain, uh, in the four direction are the residential quarters of demigods, such as Indra. And, uh, and in the... Uh, in the chariot of sun god, the sun travels on the top of mountain in an orbit called Samvatsara, encir encircling the Mount Meru. Uh, the suns travel uh, for six months in the direction of uh, northern, which is called as Uttarayana, and another six months he travels towards southern direction, which is uh, called as Dakshinayana. And uh, this will form the day and night for the demigods. Yes. And yeah. further, Maharaj, uh, uh, this uh, island is ruled by uh, uh, the Priyamvrata's son. His, no, his name is Vihihotra, and who is assisted by two of his sons, Ramanaka and Dataki. And in this planet, they are worshipping uh, Lord Brahma, and they consider Brahma as very, very powerful. So they offer their prayers to him because they consider uh, Brahma is a karma maya and uh, he performs the ritualistic ceremonies and by doing that one will uh, attain the position of position and uh, because of Vedic ritualistic hymn uh, become manifest with him and uh, he is devo very much devoted to the Supreme Lord uh, Narayana and uh, therefore in one sense he is not different from the Lord and again, uh, they don't worship as a monist, but they will worship in a duality. And uh, uh, in, in the purport, uh, uh, Srila Prabhupada mentioned, uh, the Veda says, Swadharma Nista Shatha ja Janma Bihi Puma Vivinchitam Eti. If one follows Varnashrama Dharma very nicely for 100 births, then he will be awarded the post of Lord Brahma. So this is about uh, this uh, Pushkara Vip Maharaj. Okay, thank you. So Pushkara means lotus, I understand. And you can see it's a very special lotus which is being described there. 100 million petals of gold <laughs> Not an ordinary lotus, but very special. Of course, it's the seat of Brahma, we're told also. So very nice. And they pray to the Lord. We, they offer their prayers unto Lord Brahma, the form of manifest Vedic knowledge. So Lord Brahma is called Brahma Linga, which indicate that his entire form consists of Vedic knowledge. So it's almost like you can understand, he doesn't have a, a, a gross form, it's a subtle form. His entire form consists of Vedic knowledge. So... Brahma, of course, is only worshipped at Puskar. That's a famous pastime that he was cursed by his wife because he took a second wife, couldn't wait for his wife to come. And so she cursed him that he would only be worshipped at one place, and that place was Puskar. <laughs> so here we have Puskar Adweep, and it's the outermost region of the Bhumandala. It's the outermost island anyway, ruled by one of the sons of Priyavrata. So Priyavrata had seven sons and different, there's seven islands here mentioned. And each son has been given an island and ruling and they're worshipping a particular 
form or a particular expansion or demigod. And here in Pushkaradweep they're worshipping Lord Brahma. So Lord Brahma is usually worshipped at Pushkaradweep, so this is proper. Right? This is in line, right? Lord Brahma can only be worshipped at Pushkar. And so this is Pushkaradweep, so it's, there's, it's not going against the curse. They're keeping the, the curse. All right, so we have Lord Brahma, he's our Adi Guru in our Brahma Madhva Sampradaya. He's one of the four Sampradayas, along with Lakshmi, four Kumaras and Lord Shiva. And Lord Chaitanya took his initiation in this line, coming from Lord Brahma. So Lord Brahma, he enjoys Sakya Ras relationship is said in this universe at this time, the Lord Brahma has a friendship relationship with Lord Krishna. And Srimad Bhagavatam describes how the Lord shook hands with Brahma. So, Hare Krishna Bharat, can I ask one question? All right. So, all these places also, they don't have the understanding that uh, pure devotional service is the highest. They are worshipping the different, different demigods, understanding the representative of Krishna or like... Yeah, well, they're worshipping these demigods with the understanding that they are part of Krishna, right? Hmm. So, we're told, you know, that this is a... The indirect worship of the Lord, you could say. But they do recognize that these are demigods, that they're not the Supreme Lord. Okay, so beyond the ocean, text 34, beyond the ocean of sweet water, fully surrounding it, is a mountain named Loka Loka, which divides the countries that are full of sunlight from those not lit by the sun. So you can imagine where there's no sun, you know, there are regions on our own planet. You go to some places, you know, like if you go up in the northern part of Finland, it's called the land of the midnight sun in the summertime. In the summertime, they have sunlight until midnight, but in the winter they have no sun, no light, no sunlight at all. And so it's like that. And there are parts of like that in Russia as well, northern regions of the, the universe, of the planet Earth. You don't get light. So there's a region here on Bo Mandala, which says it's called Loka, 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 Loka. Aloka means no people, no place. Loka means people, where there are people. And Aloka, no people. So it's lit, it's not lit by the sun. And beyond the ocean of sweet water, which was around the outside of Push, Pushkaradwi, is a tract of land as broad as the area between the middle of Mount Sumeru and the boundary of Manasatara Mountain. So Manasatara Mountain is important because it was mentioned that the sun god also, uh, he drives his chariot around on the Manasatara Mountain. Right? That's mentioned there in the purport of text number 30. The, in the chariot of the sun god, the sun travels on the top of the mountain in an orbit called the Samvatsara, encircling Mount Meru. So, it's described that the sun travels on the top of the Manasatara mountain, but it doesn't touch the Manasatara mountain. That would be too bumpy to go on the top of the mountain. So there's a, po but there's a pocket of air for 100 yojanas. There's a pocket of air which goes right around the mountain, right around the Mansatara mountain. 
and the, the sun god rides his chariot on that pocket of air which goes around the mountain. Mm -mm. Okay, so the boundary of Manasutari mountain. In that tract of land there are many living beings. So there's there's a tract of land, Loka, there's many people. But beyond it, extending to the Loka, Loka mountains, is another land which is made of gold. And because of its golden surface, it reflects light, like the surface of a mirror. And any physical article that falls on that land can never be perceived again. All living entities, therefore, have abandoned that golden land. So right around Pushkaradweep, outside Pushkaradweep, we have the ocean of pure water, sweet water, and then you have this golden land. And on this golden land, there's no people. On the golden land, there's no people. And then between the lands inhabited by the living entities, and those that are uninhabited stands the great mountain which separate the two and which is therefore celebrated as Lok Aloka. So between the land, between the, on one side are the living entities and on the other side is uninhabited. In the middle there's this mountain, huge mountain, huge, huge mountain, goes all the way up to Dhruva Loka. And it separates the two, the lo it separates Loka from Aloka. So the mountain is called Loka Aloka. So it has, uh, the Srimad Bhagavatam states, te text 37, By the will of Krishna, the mountain known as Loka Aloka has been installed as the outer border of the three worlds. Bur, Bhuvar and Swar, to control the rays of the sun throughout the universe. So the rays of the sun are only up to Loka Loka mountain. On the other side of Loka Loka mountain, there's no sun, there's nothing. So no people, no sun, nobody goes there. But up to Loka Loka mountain, that's where you've got the inhabitants. All the luminaries from the sun up to Dhruva Loka distribute their rays throughout the three worlds, but only within the boundary formed by this mountain. Because it's extremely high, extend even higher than Dhruva Loka, it blocks the rays of the luminaries, which therefore can never extend beyond it. So we're getting some information, interesting information about the, the geography of the universe here. We're hearing about, first of all we heard about Saptadweeps, the Saptadweeps, the seven islands, and then outside Saptadweep you have the golden land. And then outside that you have the mountain, Loka Loka mountain. And then on the out, over side, on the other side of Loka Loka, nothing. In the purport, Prabhupada writes, this vivid description of how the rays of the sun are distributed throughout the different planetary system of the universe is very scientific. Sukadeva Goswami described these universal affairs to Maharaj Parikshit as he had heard about them from his predecessors. So Prabhupada's explaining how we, we have to accept this. This is coming through the parampara. And then Prabhupada gets into uh, explaining about modern science and the history of science is only 200 years, a few hundred years. What do they know? They don't accept 
They don't accept Srimad Bhagavatam, but Prabhupada said, how can they deny the perfect astronomical calculations that existed long before they could imagine such things? So there is so much information, very perfect, accurate information with figures and distances and positions of different planets, it's all there. There's even one planet in the universe, it was only discovered a couple of hundred years ago, but it was told about in the scriptures thousands of years ago. So Prabhupada said, there is so much information to gather from Srimad Bhagavatam. Modern scientists, however, have no information of other planetary systems, and indeed are hardly conversant with the planet on which we are now living. <laughs> so what do they know? Scientists don't know anything. All right, so going ahead, 38 describes that the, they have established the truth of the, that the distance between Sumeru and the mountain known as Loka Loka is one-fourth of the diameter of the universe, or in other words, 1,000 million miles or 1 billion miles, or 125 million yojanas, one yojana being eight miles. So this is the distance between Sumeru and the mountains known as Loka Loka. That's up to where people are living. After that, nothing. So then Prabhupada says, Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur, he's given a lot of information and he did a lot of calculations. Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur was also a, a very learned astrologer. So he knew all about the planets and the movements and he did calculations. And Prabhupada has quoted it here, but it's all in Sanskrit. So I don't know quite what the translation is. The whole text is Sanskrit. Maybe one day we'll be able to get the translation. If, if any of you know Sanskrit, you might like to go through it, tell us what are the main points. Anyway, it's about, Prabhupada said, very difficult to put into English because it's, uh, it's uh, very complicated Sanskrit statements. Some more information, 39 describes about four gajapatis four elephants, big elephants, which are put there to balance the, to balance the Bhumandala, to balance the universe. The, they're put in the four directions by Lord Brahma. And we have the names of their, these elephants. They're responsible for maintaining the planetary system of the universe, to keep it level. Sometimes it may get unstable so the elephants, their job is to keep it nice and level. Then text 40, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is the master of all opulence and the master of the spiritual sky. He is the Supreme Person Bhagavan. The demigods, led by Indra, the King of Heaven, are entrusted with seeing to the affairs of the material world. Yeah, we heard on the, on the, the mountain, Manasatotara mountain, the demigods also have their residences there. Just as if they have their residences on top of Meru, they also have another residence there on Manasatara mountain. So they, they have their duties, They're, they have to see the affairs of the material world. And to benefit all the living beings and the planets, to increase the power, of the elephants and of the demigods, then the Lord himself manifests on top of that mountain in a spiritual body. 
So we're told the Lord personally appears, surrounded by his expansions and assistance like Vishwakshina. And he's fully decorated. All right, then text 41, the various forms such as Narayan and Vishnu are all decorated with different weapons. The Lord exhibits these forms to maintain all the varied planets created by his personal potency, Yoga Maya. So Yoga Maya is the Lord's potency for helping to create this everything. And Prabhupada explains in the purport, the Lord not only maintains the material creation from start to finish, but he, he personally maintains the spiritual world. So the spiritual world, that's, there's no annihilation of that. There's no creation, it's eternal. And the Lord personally oversees that. Okay, then text 42. Outside Loka Loka mountain is a tract of land known as Alokavarsh. No people, nothing there. Beyond the Lokavarsh is the destination of those who aspire for liberation from the material world. That's impersonal liberation. It is beyond the jurisdiction of the material modes of nature and therefore is completely pure. Lord Krishna took Arjuna through this place to bring back the sons of the Brahmana. Right? You all know that pastime? Yes, Maharaj, that uh, all the children were dying as soon as he would give birth and then even uh, Arjuna promised that he'll get the child back. Yes. And then they went to Mahavishnu. Is that, that the same pastime, Guru Maharaj? Yes, right. Yeah, the, the children were all taken away. Arjuna had promised he'd give up his life if he couldn't save the children. And so Arjuna's vow was, in, in, it was you know, he'd, he'd promised he'd give up his life if he couldn't save the Brahmana's child. So Lord Krishna had to take him to go to find the children. So they got on the chariot and they went through the different regions and they came to this abode. It was just darkness, dense darkness. And Lord Krishna had to fire his uh, Sudarshan chakra to make a hole in the darkness to get through it. So that was that, this, this region through the, the place to bring back the sons of the, they got to the Kajo ocean and then they found the children, the Brahmana's sons were all there with Mahavishnu. So they had to go through all that, this region, go through this abode of liberation and go through this uh, abode, the abode called Aloka, Varsha, where there's nothing, no people, just dense darkness, you know. We have darkness, but it's nothing like this darkness which is there. So the darkness was just solid. So Lord Krishna had to fire the Surasan chakra to make some area to go through. Okay, then text 43, we're told how the sun is in the middle of the universe, vertically in the middle of the universe, so it lights everything in the area between Burloka, and so it's between Burloka and Bhuvarloka, right? It's in the middle of the universe, it's directly above Mount Meru, and it's between Burloka and Bhuvarloka, which is called Antariksha, outer space. And the distance between the sun and the circumference of the universe Two billion miles. So, quite a big distance. You know, we read it here in this section of the Bhagavatam, we read about mountains which are so many hundred yojanas high. The highest mountain we have on the planet Earth is the Mount Everest. It's only like about nine kilometers high. 
is only nine kilometers high. But here in the Bhagavatam, they're telling us about mountains which are this hundreds of, you know, many, many yojanas high. So it's a totally different realm, what's being described. Because we're a small planet, Earth is only a small planet, so there's only limited, very limited things, limited phenomena which can be displayed. We have to understand how tiny the Earth is in relation to the whole cosmic manifestation. And in relation to Bomandala, even in relation to Bharat Varsha, it's not so great. Okay, so then we're told here the sun god is also called Vairaja, Vairaja, the total material body of all living entities because he entered the dull egg of the universe at the time of creation, he is also called Martanda. Martanda, the, de the dead egg. He entered into the dead egg and he brought it to life. Right? And he's called also Haranyagarbha because he received the material body from Haranyagarbha, Lord Brahma. Haranya means gold, and Garba, the, that womb, the cosmic womb. So, Haranya Garba, because the sun god comes from Lord Brahma, so he can also be known by the same name as his father. And the purport Prabhupada explains, whether Brahma is the Supreme Personality of Godhead or an ordinary living being, he is known as Vairaj Brahma and Haranyagarbha Brahma. Therefore, the Sun God is also accepted as Vairaja Brahma. Okay, that pretty much covers everything. The Sun God and the Sun Planet divide all the directions. It is only because of the Sun that we can understand higher planets and lower planets and hellish planets. This is all due to the presence of the sun or the lack of the sun. You can understand which, re which regions are for liberation, which regions are hellish and which regions are subterranean. All right. Okay, so that Pretty much, let's cover, it. we'll just do this last verse. All living entities, all different living entities, depend on the heat and light given by the sun god from the sun planet. That was brought up when we were talking about the sun. And, the, and therefore, the Lord is called Drig Ishwara, the personality of Godhead presiding over sight. Because without the sun, we cannot see anything. So the sun god is called Drig Ishwara, allowing us to see. Surya is the life and soul of this universe, and there are innumerable universes for which a sun god is the life and soul. Just as the Supreme Personality of Godhead is the life and soul of the entire creation. All right, are there any questions or comments? Anything to be discussed? Is everyone keeping up? Are you following? We have been talking here about the different, the, the seven islands created by Priyabrata. And he gave each of the islands to one of his sons. He had seven sons. In, in Jambudweep, there were nine divisions. And the nine divisions were given to the, the nine sons of Bharat. So the next, we're going on the next class, chapter 21, we'll, re, we'll hear about the movements of the sun. 
and we'll hear about how day and night take place and how the seasons come and eclipses and so on. So you can look over that chapter, 21. It's not a big chapter, but interesting information. Some devotees really get absorbed in this cosm cosmic, uh, the cosmology, Vedic cosmology. Some devotees really specialize in it and they do a lot of things, so make a lot of books and presentations on it. So if you like to study it more, very good. You can understand more about the universe. Okay, so we will stop here tonight. Thank you very much. Today's the courtesy here. Is it the courtesy there? Okay, so we should stop now. So I hope you had a good courtesy. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Go back to Vrinda Ki Jai. Yeah.